Welcome back to the Better Man, Better Ball Player podcast. I'm your host, Trey Cobb. I want to thank you for joining us here on our 108th episode of the podcast. We get a chance to talk to Coach Cliff Godwin from East Carolina University. Coach Godwin, is this is a pretty special one for me because in terms of the podcast being called Better Men, Better Ball Players and the philosophy uh, is something that I've looked up to Coach Godwin from afar and um, him as he runs his program and the things that he says and the things that he does and what they do and what they believe about is really something that has really spoken to me. Uh, and it's really, this is a pretty one that I remember and pretty thankful for. And I'm glad that I'm able to share this and, and give this to other people and, and we're able to continue to share the message of winning the people battle and, and teaching good people and, 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 and using the game to teach us lessons on and off the field and bringing those to life. Um, Coach Godwin, for those people who don't know, like I said, head coach at uh, East Carolina University, 13 NCAA regionals, been a part of two college World Series. He's been the four-time conference coach of the year, six NCAA regional berths, where they've hosted four times at ECU, four Super Regional appearances. In 22, they just recently hosted a Super Regional. Three conference championships, all tournament crowns, has a record of 304, 151, and 1, as well as a record at ECU. Uh, 20 players have earned All American status, 23 regional selections, 33 all conference, 14 players drafted. Overall, 64 players have gone to play, play professional baseball during his time as a coach. He's been on the USA Baseball national team staff twice, most recently this summer with Coach Bianco. Um, and I would say most importantly, uh, and, and what he would say is that he's a big, strong, strong man of faith, and he says as his faith has grown over the years, he is one of the most well-respected people, people in college baseball, and um, it was a real pleasure to speak to him and have a great conversation and being able to share that uh, with people, and so as we continue to, to spread the, the message about what our game can actually do for people. So uh, really thankful for him and also thankful for our guys at Netting Pros. Netting Pros are providing, improving and providing programs one facility at a time. Netting professionals specialize in design, fabrication, installation of custom netting for backstops, batting cages, dugout scoreboards, BP screens, and ball carts. They also design and install digital graphic wall padding, windscreen, turf, turf protectors, dugout benches, dugout cubbies, and more. Netting professionals continue to provide quality products and services to many recreation, high school, and college fields, facilities, and stadiums throughout the country. Contact them today at 844-620-2707 or info at nettingpros.com. Visit them online at www.nettingpros.com or check out Netting Pros on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and LinkedIn for all their latest products and projects. So again, Call Will, Will Miner. Follow them. On fa- follow them on all your Twitter. Watch the great things that they're doing now. Thanks to Will Miner and all those guys at Nending Pros for making something like this happen to continue to help us grow and feed the message of the Better Man, Better Ball Player podcast. So again, thank you so much. And again, thank you to Coach Godwin. We discuss a lot um, from his culture, his advice on players, his journey as a coach, and what those what coaching really means and what what it means to him and and uh, in his process. So. Want to get right into it? So here he is, head coach at East Carolina, Coach Cliff Godwin. That stuff means a lot less to me than it used to. I mean, it's, you know, I used to get caught up in that stuff, and it's not that big a deal. (laughs) In the grand scheme of things, it's, hey, I'm not going to be able to take the trophies and the rings with me, you know, so – you know, one of my mentors this morning, I met with him and, you know, I, I told him that like the rings just don't mean, you know, I got a desk full of championship rings from places I've coached. And of course, a lot of East Carolina and he goes, those rings rep- represent relationships. And I went, now we're, now we can talk, you know, that that's something I can look at those and say, you know, think about all those players that were a part of that and the relationships that we're able to build, whether it be at Ole Miss or LSU or wherever I've coached. Yeah, I think that's powerful, man. Those rings represent uh, relationships. So, Coach, let me ask you, you said, like, it, it was from the beginning. It, 
you said not anymore. Like, was there a big change? Like, what was it that changed in you to feel like that? Like, cause it, is it easy to say it once you've had the success, you know, like, could you have been the same guy you were if you had started that way? I think that, cause I think that's the hang up. I honestly yeah. think like from a young kid, like, well, I haven't established myself yet, you know? Right. Well, I, I just, you know, at a young age, uh, you know, I grew up in a very small town, but my dad was a high school basketball coach, my mom, school nurse. My grandparents were tobacco farmers. So in the summer, I worked on the farm and then went and played American Legion baseball. Um, baseball actually wasn't my first love. Basketball was because that's what my dad did. You know, he coached basketball. So from the time I could walk, I was in a gym. Um, early memories of trying to shoot it and not let it hit the ground if I made it or missed it because he's having basketball practice on the other end and he was going to be pissed if a noise sounded while he's teaching basketball to high school kids. So that those were my early moments. Um, you know, like most guys in that area that played basketball, you know, be Michael Jordan, you know, everybody wanted to be Michael Jordan, you know, my era. So that's what I wanted to do, but I played football, played basketball, played baseball. Well, my high school coach, he's actually in the North Carolina sports hall of fame won a ton of state championships at my high school. I never won a state championship in high school, but he won a ton. And, you know, everybody told me once, you know, I would focus on baseball, that would be where I could reach my fullest potential if I'd focus on it year round. And that's what I did. He twisted coach Gary Overton's arm at the time, give me an opportunity. And back then, um, you know, I registered my freshman year. I needed to, I wasn't very good. Our team wasn't very good. And then, we hire a coach named Keith LeClaire and you find out in the newspaper, and this guy talks about going to Omaha in the college world series. And I don't, I'm not the smartest guy, but I feel like I have a lot of common sense. And I'm like, well, I will, I, I was redshirted on a bad team. Uh, and this guy's talking about playing in the college world series and going to Omaha. I better get my crap together pretty quickly. Um, or I'm not going to be around here. There were 12 in my freshman class. Three of us survived, so to speak. And I was one of the three and, I tell our teams all the time, I really, and back then, I just was trying to work my tail off. I didn't really know what I was doing, but I was going to be a great student. I was going to be the first one to practice, the last one to leave, to buy myself enough time to kind of let my, the rawness of my talent kind of catch up with itself. But I, I wasn't an all-conference player until my fifth year. I was on really good teams. We were three number one seeds in regionals. My sophomore, junior, senior year, we were a national seed. My senior year, we couldn't host regionals here at East Carolina because we had Harrington Field, which is basically a high school field. And now we have Clark LeClaire because the teams that I was a small part of helped raise money for the facility that we have here today. And, of course, we've had a lot of renovations. But I tell you all that because I just was – hard charger, work your tail off, um, not stepping over people, not doing it with no integrity, but really was kind of in a bubble, if that makes sense. And then I went into coaching and kind of the same thing. It was, to me, it was all about winning. And, you know, the one thing I would think a lot of guys would respect about me was, you know, always worked hard, always, you know, push players to be their best version of themselves. But probably I didn't dive into – the personal side as much as I probably should have, but I had great relationships as an assistant. And then you get a head coaching job and you understand very quickly that they don't walk into your office like they did as an assistant coach, because now you're the head coach. You had to invite those conversations and how I evolved over my head coaching career to basically schedule one-on-one -on -one meetings with a lot of our players just to see how they're doing and not necessarily talk about baseball. It might turn into um, that was important to me um, as I continued to grow. And um, my faith has grown tremendously. And it really kind of happened in, in COVID. And I say by accident, but God put a guy in my life, Mike Aman, who's a huge donor at East Carolina. And he was worried about me. I was actually in a pretty good headspace because as a coach, they cancel the season. Your kids go back home, but we were still in school virtually. And so, the job as a coach is to make sure your guys do good in school. So that was like, you know, on to the next thing kind of thing and um, not really worried about what the world, what was going to happen the next day. It was just focus on the day at hand and worry about our guys being focused on school. And, but he dropped the John Maxwell leadership Bible off of my desk and we just started talking and he said, I'd love to be your accountability partner if, if you would allow me to. And 
that uh, April, April 18th, my grandmother passed away and my mom asked me to speak at the funeral and I said, no way, I'll be a wreck and I'll be way too emotional and I won't get any words out. And uh, Mike said, you can do it. And he helped me out with some scripture. And of course, my mom gave me an out as we're pulling into the cemetery and said, you don't have to do it if you don't want to. And and I said, no, I'm, I'm going to um, because you asked me to do it. And I told our team it's probably the hardest thing up until that moment in my life that I had to do because I just didn't want to do it. And I, like no in, inside of me wanted to get up and speak at my grandmother's funeral because I was so close to my grandparents growing up on the farm to going through and, and you know, having a season in 21 to, you know, we won, but, you know, no fans in the stands until the regional and we were able to win the regional and then we get sent to Vanderbilt and, you know, in 19 and 21, we faced four first rounders <laughs> in mm. super regionals at Louisville and uh, Vanderbilt. And then, you know, 22 rolls around or the fall of 21. And, and, and I'm probably getting too personal, but you talk about some adversity that we've had handed to us. Uh, Nico Agnos passed away at the end of September from COVID and, and Jake Agnos pitched for us from 2017 to 2019. And Zach's on the team. And, uh, man, that hit me like a, a ton of bricks. And I was trying to be strong for the Agnos family. They, they don't pass out a coaching handbook of when a father dies of one of your players. And I was right. super close with Nico. And then I got COVID as soon as, almost as soon as we got back from the celebration of life up in Northern Virginia. And, you know, that fall, the fall, I just COVID just lingered with me and I couldn't, you know, work out like I wanted to. And, do the things that I felt like I should be able to, because uh, I like to have a lot of energy at practice. I just didn't feel, I still brought it, but it just was a grind to one of our best pitchers uh, being suspended for the entire year for taking a supplement over the counter and being suspended by the NCAA to, uh, you know, starting out 14 and 13 and uh, just not playing well, like, you know, preseason number eight to not playing well to uh, really the team buying into being selfless and not worrying about we don't have starting rotation. We're just going to treat every pitcher like a closer and maybe by the end of the inning, close it out, and then we'll just keep passing the ball. And, you know, this definitely wasn't one of the most talented teams, but we're inches away from going to the College World Series and hosting the first ever Super Regional on uh, on East U's campus because my – Senior year in 01, we had to host the Super Regional in Kinston because we couldn't host it at our home field because of our facility. So it was awesome. I, I don't know if you watched any of the Super Regional, but I've coached oh, yeah. at some some great places, Ole Miss and LSU, and there's been more fans, but there's never been a place louder, in my opinion, where it was Stephanie on the field. And I get chill bumps talking about it to, you know, being a part of the USA staff again this summer and having one of our players on there to, you know, getting back. And we've had another – tragedy with one of our incoming players it was in a boating accident and he just had part of his right leg amputated so i, I feel like i've been a few rounds with mike tyson uh, i'm still standing though so uh I, I feel good about that but man it's it's been challenging but as mike a man and i met this morning uh you know jesus was in the wilderness for 40 days and 40 nights and the devil tempted him three times and I, i'm not uh as well versed as mike is but you know, when you're in the middle of it, sometimes it sucks, but God's always with you. And, and I've got to have the faith that he's with me through this time. And, you know, I believe I'm at East Carolina because of those moments, not because of the championships, it's because I'm here to be a pillar of strength for families in need. And, and when players need something, when it has no relation to baseball, do I think I'm the best baseball mind in the, in the coaching? No, absolutely not. I'm not bad, but I'm more of a coach and uh, helping people. And I think that's what God has put me on this planet to do is to be there for people in tough times. And it's not easy. You know, nobody's life's easy. And that's why baseball probably, in my opinion, teaches you more about the game of life than any other sport because it's a game of failure. Absolutely. Uh, well said. I mean, is <sighs> – is this something that you've also like brought into like, uh, like kind of like your lessons and things like that? Like, um, have you seen a change in like maybe your classroom sessions or things you talk about with your teams uh, where it's not, you know, you, you have this, I say, well, I'd say other part, but like this part of like, like you said, t talking through the tough situations and dealing with that. Do you have, have you, you bring that more into your team? 
Oh, yeah. I mean, when it hits close to home, when you have a father of one of your players that a lot of the players are super close with and they see the the struggle, you know, like I think I worried more about Jake Agnos than I did Zach because Zach had us. He had, you know, the team, the family, East Carolina, um, the community of Greenville was so great to his family where Jake was off playing professional baseball and rehabbing uh, Tommy John and, and more alone. I worried more probably about Jake than I did Zach just because Zach was here every day and you get to see him. And I know Zach had tough moments, but man, he put a smile on every day to come to practice. And, and that was kind of his, uh, you know, place that he could just get away from everything else and just think about baseball and play the game that he, that he loved. But yeah, I mean, it's, it's in your face. I mean, look, uh, have one of your incoming players be in a, horrific boating accident and lose part of his right leg um there's no textbook for that <laughs> like it's not hey when, when you sign up to be a head coach or to be a coach in general there's no textbook so you got to navigate it and you got to talk to them and it's okay to have feelings and not feel great about it and have a bad day but you know that's what we're here for to, to help you get through all those things so yes of course and we have a devotional piece to to our program it's called sport works and we have two guys that come in every Monday night and feed the guys that want to be a part of it. That's something that, you know, we don't do is we, we talk, I talk about my faith. Um, I don't push it on people. Um, I was turned off as a teenager when people would try to push it on me because, you know, as a 16 year old, you're a lot smarter than anybody else. Uh, at least you think you are when in reality you're, you're not wise at all. So, uh, but we have that piece of it as well. So, a lot, a lot of our guys, you know, dive into that piece. And, and that piece has been here since I played here. Um, um, it started in the fall of 98. So that's something that we've been able to stay consistent with over the years. It's called Sport Words. Is that what you said? Sport, sport Works. Yep. Yep. Coach Claire actually started it in the fall of, of 98 with a guy named Chuck Young. And Chuck left a couple years ago to be a, a pastor in Sublet, Kansas. And I didn't want to lose the name. And he, he worked with several programs, but we were able to find two uh, people in the community that just want to volunteer their time and help people. And they come in and do devotionals with our guys uh, every Monday night, like I said. And uh, we have a fund, a bank account to help pay for the meals. And so the guys can get a great meal and also get the word at the same time. And then they also do it in the spring on Sundays when we have home games before our team meals and guys can get the word before we play on Sundays. Wow, that's awesome, coach. Um, and you said that's the, you've you've done that since '98. You guys have done that since '98. Yeah, since 1998. I can't take any credit for it. We've just continued it on since you know I've been here as the head coach. Um, you know, in the summer of 2014. Mm, that's awesome. Now you said it, it is it is necessarily uh, I guess it's not mandatory to push on anyone. Um, for the time, um, I guess uh, uh, I was I was thinking of uh, when your culture, like I'm just thinking in terms of culture and, and when, at the times that you need to be there and you talk about your culture. I remember like you taking over, you talk about pirate, being a pirate, you know, like are those are, are those everyday classroom sessions that you get to when, you, when you're, when you're talking about discussing your culture? Well, it, it's, it's really, we hit them hard with when they come back to school in the fall, especially the new guys. But um, you know, every one of our guys have, has to get up in front of the team every fall and recite our mission our motto, our vision, and the Pirates paragraph. I mean, that's something that's important to me. You, you can't start out 14 and 13 if you don't have a foundation of culture. And I'm not the coach. I cringe because I always want to make sure. But that's something you got to work on every day. Um, culture is way more important than any mechanical skill that you can ever teach a guy from throwing a baseball um, to hitting a baseball because there's going to be a time when mechanics are off what are they going to fall back on? What are they going to fall back on their training? And their training is going to stem back to our Pirates culture. And, and that's important to me. And um, I, I said this, and, and I really didn't know what I was saying after we lost to Texas, but I, I don't need to go to Omaha as a head coach for my ego. I, I probably needed that a few years ago. Um, you know, I, I don't need that. You know, I want it for the other people more than me. I want it for Lynn LeClaire, Coach LeClaire's wife and his family and the guys I played with that were so close and the, the guys that played before me that maybe didn't even have that. Um, but Pirate Nation wants it so bad and, and I want it for them, but I, I don't need that for my ego. And 
I think this day and age, especially the ego gets in the way of a lot of people. And I'm not just talking about coaches. I mean, I'm talking about players. I'm talking about people that have no affiliation with sports. And um, I'm a firm believer, the more you give, the more you receive. And I'm a, I mean, I'm a living example of that. Um, you know, I wouldn't be where I am today if a lot of people hadn't poured into me. Um, in terms of like, have you stayed, um, cause I'm like, I, I love Brian Kane, Brian Kane's, uh, I've got, I've had a ch- chance to have Brian Kane on the podcast and, um, Kaner has been a, a thing. And I know when you took over, you started pirates and the acronym of pirates. Is that something has, how has that evolved since 2014? Um, well, the pirates acronym has stayed pretty consistent and, yeah. um, but and our mission is stay pretty consistent. Our mission is to always be growing on and off the field. So to grow, you got to be pushed. You got to be pushed out your out, outside of your comfort zone. Our motto has stayed consistent at times, but th- this year actually, and, and our players don't even know this. So I'm giving you a, a piece of. Uh, but I thought about this during the spring because I felt like we got derailed with a few different, you know, just chinks in the armor from our culture. So it's going to be a triangle and uh, at the bottom of the triangle is going to be trust. And I think there's so much information out there today that there's got to be an unbelievable amount of trust between the coaches and the players. And it's got to be a two way street. It can't be a one way street. It can't be that they just trust us and we don't trust them. Now with trust, there's also um, experience, you know, so for a guy like Lane Hoover or Garrett Saylor or Carter Spivey, who are going to be fifth year guys in our program, man, we got five years of, of examples of trust that have been displayed both ways where a freshman comes in and, you know, they're hitting coach back home thinks that they should do this. And it's not that they're hitting coach back home. Doesn't know what he's talking about, but they're just not here every day. And, and that's my biggest argument with any pitching coach or hitting coach from afar is, man, you, you got to be there every day. You got to understand the different, dynamics the different variables that go into hitting pitching fielding a ground ball and you know we're coaches and and we're going to do whatever we can to help them we would never give them any information that we didn't believe in the bottom of our heart that would help them be the best player they could be now does that mean that we're 100 percent right all the time absolutely not look there's only been one person that was 100 percent right all the time that walked on this earth and it was jesus christ so uh no we're we're not perfect but at the end of the day it's got to be it's going to be unlimited trust on both sides. And then, you know, on one side, it's going to be selfless of the triangle where, look, at the end of the day, you've got to pour yourself into to East Carolina baseball, to our program, in a time where society wants to do everything for themselves and how is this going to benefit me? Well, you can ask our older players, when they stop worrying about themselves and they start pouring into these young guys, even though those young guys could actually take their position, they play better because they're pouring into other people. So you got to be selfless. And then the communication side of the triangle is huge. It's guys are on their phones all the time. You know, they Snapchat, but there's got to be communication. If you're not feeling well, if your arms bother you, we're not mind readers. If something comes up, you, you got to communicate on the front end. I mean, that's the real world. You can't be late for something and said, Oh, by the way, you know, I had a flat tire, you know, when you get the flat tire, you got to call us and let us know. So then that that's what the real world does. I mean, you can't show up late for your job and expect that you're going to have a job because they're going to fire you. Um, at least they used to. Now they're probably more lenient since COVID. I think that's, uh, you know, made a lot of people more lenient with, with people in general. But uh, so that's going to be our motto. And then our vision stays the same. I mean, it's really our goals. And at the bottom of the pyramid is get 1% better every day, which is something you can touch. And then it's win 40 plus regular season games, win the AAC uh, regular season championship, host a regional, host a super regional, win the national championship. And at the very top of the pyramid is graduate from ECU. That's not something we talk about every day. We talk about getting 1% better every day, but we don't talk about the rest. I mean, that's just a byproduct of what we're doing every single day. Um, So um, that's our mission, our motto and our vision. And then, the Pirates paragraph, and I know you've heard this a thousand times probably because you've done your research, but we compete with the purpose, have a plan for everything we do and a reason why we do it. We live with integrity and do what is right at all times, even when no one's watching. We are responsible and have the power to choose our response in any situation. We are in control of our attitudes and our energy givers. We have the toughness to compete or have the toughness to embrace adversity. 
and keep moving forward. Um, we pursue excellence and a lifestyle to be great. We are selfless, put we over me and execute our role for the team. We are pirates. So it's not just a cool slogan. I mean, like I said, uh, I force our guys to memorize it because it's the foundation of our program. And when stuff doesn't go well, we can always fall back on, like I said, our training. Well, that you fall back on your training and then you're like, you said, you're training the culture. Um, you know, and you say you don't talk about things every day. You talk about getting 1% better each day. Like that's, that's what you say is considered literally like what you talk about every day. Yeah. Well, and the reason being is when coach Leclerc got hired and, and I was a player, like we always break down our Omaha. Well, at that time, ECU baseball needed a vision like, Hey man, we can actually get there. So let's break down our Omaha. So when I got here, um, we initially broke down in Omaha. And then as I got to thinking, I'm like, well, we know we can get there. We've been close, even though we haven't been there. Like we know that we're in the conversation. So we don't need to break it out because you would only know if you've played here and if you've been a part of ECU, but you know, it's uh, the blessing and the curse. We've been to more regionals than any other baseball program in the country that hasn't been to the college world series. So that's good and bad. You know, the good is that we've been to more, regionals than any other baseball program in the country. The bad is that we're the team that hasn't played in the college world series. And um, yeah, does it, it bother me? It, it does because I know that we've been so close so many times, but I know we're doing the right things. I know we're bringing in the right people to our program. We develop our players. Um, like I said, we're not smarter than anybody else, but we do things the right way. And, you know, we've hosted four regionals in a row and we've won three regional championships in a row. Um, there's very few teams that can say that. And then we've had a 3.4 team GPA or higher for five straight years when we were hired here to ECU. And, and this isn't because of me, but it's because the expectations that we put on our guys and the culture. But when we got here, we, ECU baseball on record had never had a 3.0 team GPA. And now we've had five straight years of a 3.4 or higher. So those things matter to me because you're setting your guys up for success in life. And, and that's the important thing for me. 100% love it. Um, so, I'm, and so I'm wondering, as, as you continue to grow and your, your culture continues to strengthen, um, have you seen, like, it's attracting specific guys? Like, are you attracting a certain type of ki uh, kid more uh, uh, and, and getting those kind of calls? Or, like, are, do you, are, you are, you, are you still having to search? Are you, like, I guess that's what I'm wondering is, like, are you still – do you feel like you're not the search as hard, I guess? I'm, well, I'm sure you're still I mean, doing your due diligence, but I'm wondering, like, do you feel like you're also attracting – that as well well i i would hope so i think that you know we'll probably have to continue to evaluate that as we continue to get farther along in our career here at east carolina i mean i'm going into my ninth season which the COVID year is in there as well but jeff palumba does an unbelievable job austin knight um heath blackman was out a lot this summer because i was with the collegiate national team uh, they know what works at east carolina and what i mean by that is look if you don't like to work hard it's not going to work here. I, I sit in front of parents or on some calls with parents and I, I make sure that we tell them who we are because I never want to twist somebody's arm to come to East Carolina and not tell them exactly who we are. Because once they get here, they go, Oh man, you didn't tell me that we're going to work hard every But ask me the question of, Hey, is it made it easier recruiting? Uh, yeah. Like I'm just thinking of like just the yeah, attraction yeah. of, of, of being like, man, I want to go. Cause yeah. you know, like, cause like I said, me, like I know, I just want to reach out to you in terms of like the podcast. I'm right. just wondering, is, is that, is that how you're getting from a, an well, athlete? I, I, I would definitely say it hasn't hurt, especially when you have national TV exposure, like we had, you know, this year of hosting a super regional and um, just having record crowds, you know, at the regional and the super regional, it definitely hasn't hurt, but still, Jeff Palumbo, who heads up our recruiting, and Austin Knight, our pitching coach, and, and Keith Blackman, who was able to go out um, this summer because I was with the collegiate national team. They know what we're looking for. We're looking for a player, obviously, that can come in and help us win a national championship, but they got to work hard. They got to be serious about their academics. It's not just me on a podcast talking about it. They know that. So they do their homework before they ever bring me you know, a name and say, Hey, look, we want to bring this guy in or we want you to offer him a scholarship because I never want kids or parents to come to East Carolina and not know exactly what we do here. And I tell our players when they see 
recruits if they're coming on campus, like tell them who we are. Don't sugarcoat it because I would rather somebody not come here that didn't want to be a part of that consistent hard work that we do in the classroom, on the baseball field, in the weight room, then get them here and they go, man, you didn't tell me this was what it was going to be like. And I think a lot of kids, even when we tell them that, you know, the consistency of the work ethic that we put into uh, a day-to-day basis still grinds on them, which, I mean, that's why we've been able to sustain the success that we've had over the past four years in the classroom and also on the field is consistent work ethic. You know, this year was the first time that we didn't have anyone in our locker room who had been on a, in my opinion, uh, unsuccessful team, which in 17, we had some injuries, but our culture wasn't what it needed to be. And I take full uh, accountability for that because I'm the leader of the organization. Um, But we lost the last game of the conference tournament championship. We finished last in the regular season in the conference but then we got healthy and we got to the championship game and we lost. And I tell people that that's the best thing that's ever happened to ECU baseball since I've been here because it made me self-reflect and look in the mirror and say, what can I do better? And if we'd have won that conference tournament championship game, I probably wouldn't have self-reflected like that. And now you look up and we've hosted four regionals in a row after that. And we've won three super regionals in a row. And we talked about the GPA being a 34 uh, team GPA are higher for five straight years. So, you know, I always go back to that moment. Uh, I felt like we won probably too quick in the first two years. And then all of a sudden, you know, I, I probably gave some seniors too much rope and we started cutting corners in some areas and that's what happens. But we were able to rebound pretty quickly and then we sustained a lot of success over the past four years. Yeah, you sure have, Coach. Um, it, it's, 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 it's awesome. It's awesome to see. So I would just um, – Speaking of the USA baseball stuff, you, you mentioned that, and that's where your assistant was able to go out and, uh, and recruit. Uh, how was it being able to balance all that, you know, with a tremendous honor of being able to put USA across your chest? Like, you know, as as challenging as your job is, uh, being a head coach at ECU at a big time program, to be able to then also put USA baseball on top of that. Well, I was able to do it back in the summer of 2018 and, and coach two of our players with Jake Agnos and Brian Packard, um, which At the time, ECU had never had a guy on the USA Collegiate National Team up to that point. And Paul Maneri, who I worked with at Notre Dame and LSU, he was the head coach. He asked me, and Brian O'Connor was the pitching coach, and Jim Hendry um, was like the professional guy who's hilarious. But I had a great summer. And really, the only reason I did it again as an assistant coach was because of Mike Bianco. Uh, When I found out that Coach B was going to be – the head coach, I just reached out to him and said, Hey, look, if if you need a hitting coach, I'd love to be there and be just because it's with you. And um, of course it was awesome. And uh, Josh holiday was one of the assistants who I knew from afar, but great dude. And Scott Brown was the pitching coach and um, he's another great dude. So, you know, we got to spend a lot of time together and then you're working with the best players in the country, but the only way, you feel comfortable as a head coach to be able to go out and do that is when you have a great staff. And and I mentioned Jeff Palumbo, Austin Knight, Heath Blackman, Blake Hardigree, and Colby Bortles, and our strength coach and our athletic trainer. You know, those guys are why I can do that. I mean, if you didn't have a great staff, you wouldn't feel comfortable being gone for a month. And, and I can't say enough uh, positive things about our staff because they made the ship continue to sell because all of our incoming guys were here uh on campus for summer school and i saw those guys for like a couple days and then boom i'm gone for a month and i saw them for a couple more days and they were out of summer school so um you got to have a great staff and and our staff did an unbelievable job managing all that yeah i'm sure um yeah it's just super super cool just being able to you had an unbelievable staff that's what i was just looking back through it you know like i said doing my research and just the staff was pretty pretty amazing you know this year with with coach bianco and and you and that yeah, was just a, what an unbelievable staff just what do you pick up like what do you pick up from that like your conversations like are you taking anything like is there anything like you're, you thought you think oh i think i could do this better like do you ever talk baseball and see what you can what you can bring back well we you know as baseball coaches you're always talking baseball but I, I probably talk more leadership stuff than yep. as far as baseball specific, but Josh Holiday and I would talk hitting and be talking about different players. And 
you know, trying to help them, give them a little nugget. I mean, look, when you're coaching USA baseball, you're not trying to revamp anybody's swing. I can tell sure. you what happens. It's just you're trying to give them little nuggets of information. And um, But Josh was awesome, and he's probably way more knowledgeable about hitting than I am because uh, he's grown up uh, – you know, from day one as being in a baseball family, I mean, his entire family has been a part of high level baseball. Um, so it was awesome being around him. And of course, Coach Bianco and his family, his entire family were there. So it was a great experience. But, you know, I, I talk more probably about leadership and how they manage different situations that come up with players or their team more than probably the specifics of a swing or pitching mechanics. That's kind of the the default I go to because I'm all about trying to make better people. Um, and of course, yeah, you got to teach guys how to be better hitters and all that good stuff. But I think you got to start working from the inside out before you can start teaching them how to hit or how to pitch and do all that stuff that they want to do. Now, and, and I, I love that and I'm totally on board and I, I said all about it. So I'm just, just curious. Um, Cause for me, it's, it's learning from guys like you that I'm like, look, like this is where I am. It, was it Coach LeClaire? Like that was kind of like that as well. Was it something there? Was it your time with Paul Well, What was it that kind of helped you build that that same that kind of philosophy? Well, it's been a work in progress since the day I, day I was born. You know, going back <laughs> to my dad, my high school coach, uh, you know, my football coach in high school, um, coming to East Carolina playing for Coach LeClaire. And look, I mean, you think about the head coaches that I, I, I've worked for before I became a head coach. I worked for Mark Scaff, who – won a ton of games at UNC Wilmington. That was my first collegiate job. And then I worked for Tim Corbin, who's won multiple national championships at Vanderbilt. And then Paul Maneri, who won a national championship. And then I went to UCF for three years. And, and really, that was a great learning experience for me because, no offense, I was kind of on the fast track and going. I was at places where, not that you got every recruit that you're recruiting, but uh, a lot of people weren't turning away from you when you called them. Well, when we got to UCF, you think about all the schools in Florida, I think we were probably lowest on the, the pecking order. And I was dropped off in a state of Florida that I spent a little bit of time when I was five years old at Disney World, but I had no idea about what high schools were where and who those coaches were. So it was really me going in blind as a recruiting coordinator at the time. And that's where Jeff Palumbo was as an assistant. So we were an assistant together for three years. And then going to work for coach Bianco for three years. And of course he's won a national championship. So it's just taking bits and pieces of each of those experiences and learning from some of the best coaches in the country. I mean, three of the head coaches have won national championships and then keeping my personality. I think when people try to imitate and be somebody who they're not totally, then kids can see that. I mean, you got to be yourself. And uh, I think the number one thing is our kids know that I'm hard on them. I work them hard, but at the end of the day, if something happens and they really need me, that I'm always going to be there for them. So um, I think you're able to push them a little bit harder when they know that ultimately you've got their back in the time of need. And how are you, like, if I can ask a little bit, like, how are you in, in, and are you intentional about that? Like, does it like, cause you know, like some guys are out there during stretches like that, you know, just kind of giving good touches, kind of checking in. Is it a, uh, office hour thing is like are you open up like like how are you intentional about those i'm sure that you are and kid, those kids know it well I, I try to speak to every one of our players every day it's a little bit harder because i'm with the position players but i try to go through um when the pitchers are playing catch and just say what's up to them and um i do i'm very intentional with scheduling meetings with individual players throughout the week um, and scheduling that time out because, like I said, as a head coach, they don't come into your office quite as much um, because you're the guy that writes out the lineup. So I'm very intentional in having those meetings. And, and also when you see some body language that's maybe off in a, in a negative way that you spend some time and you call that player in and just invest some time and just, hey, man, what's going on? Like you look a little off and maybe nothing's going off, but maybe they – bombed a test or something like who knows what what's going on in their world but to just be there for them and try to educate them on how we can get through that situation but it's got to be very intentional because as a head coach you're pulled in a lot of different directions and, and so are assistants but you know the one thing for me is when I walk out of practice like my cell phone doesn't go out there with me so that's the one time like you're not going to get in touch with me unless you physically show up or you call my ops guy or something and, and it's an emergency because that's their time. 
you know, and, and I don't want to ever take away from their time. Pretty powerful coach. My cell phone does not come out with me to practice, especially as a like a head coach at your at, at you know of, of your stature um, and the program that you guys have. Um, knowing how much you guys have to, you know, you're just like you said, you're pulled so many different directions. Oh man, uh, awesome stuff, coach. Um, so um, just like you kind of touched base with like you're just like with the with the. Uh, the position players, you know, just kind of diving into some, into some baseball stuff, just like with the baseball players. And like, are you, um, I guess, I guess building a staff, I guess I'm thinking about is um, how you are. Um, I would say managing the staff, you know, like um, from a standpoint of, you know, just managing the game, coaching third base, you know, the hitters, the defense, like how do you manage uh, your staff when it comes to like, uh, I would say, like you said, when you're working with the hitters and when you're with the, the positioning and the, uh, um, yeah, I would say the positioning of it. Yeah. So it's just, it's, it's very dynamic, you know, it changes all the time. And, and, you know, just from, and I'll go back to the summer of, of 2021, you know, our pitching coach at the time was Jason Dietrich and he got the head coaching job at, uh, Cal state Fullerton, which was awesome. And so now you got a pitching coach and job open. Well, Austin Knight, who played for uh, Ole Miss for four years, but I coached him uh, for three years at Ole Miss before I got the head coaching job here. He was our volunteer assistant, but he was kind of coach, not kind of, he was Coach Dietrich's assisting pi- assistant pitching coach. He was with the pitchers during their throw one. He'd be down there for bullpens, but he also – work with the catchers because I trusted him because I coached him and I gave him the catching. So when, when Deech took the Cal state Fullerton job, I wanted Austin to be our pitching coach and I had a ton of interest, but I knew Austin was ready to move in that role. Initially, I didn't want him to have the recruiting stuff on his plate as far as missing fall practice, having to go out and recruit. So he was technically still our volunteer assistant and I appreciate his ego not getting in the way. And he's a fairly young guy, but I was pouring all the camp money into him. So he's making a good salary, but I wanted him to be a practicing. He's like, coach, no problem. That's great. Uh, be a pitching coach. Like, that's awesome. Well, we hired David Macias, who um, was going to work with the catchers and also work with the position players. And he was here the entire fall. And then, Uh, In December, the Padres called and, you know, offered him a a big league coaching position to be the first base coach for the San Diego Padres. So not Mm -hmm. great timing by any means. And and I don't fault Mass for for leaving. But then when that happened, I didn't want to bring anybody external in from our program to coach our players because the foundation of of our guys that were here, like had been placed in, put into place, so to speak with our guys. So then I moved Austin into the full-time role and, you know, he was the second assistant theoretically. And then Colby Bortles, who was our director of uh, baseball operations at the time and wanted to be on the field, moved him into the volunteer role and um, switched some titles, but it is about hiring the right people. And, And the one piece of advice I would give people from my experience. And like I said, I don't have all the answers, but if you hire young people, who are hardworking and loyal, even if they lack a little bit of experience, it'll work out. And and sometimes when you hire someone who is experienced, maybe they don't work as hard, maybe they're not as loyal. And, you know, Paul Maneri told me this when he first hired me, well, he asked a question to me, he said, do you know the one thing I need from you as an assistant coach? And I was young back then. I'm in my mid twenties and I'm thinking like great hitting coach, like great recruiter, work with the catchers. Like that's all that stuff's going through my mind, but I didn't say anything out loud. And he said, I need your loyalty. And that always stuck with me. And then when I became a head coach, I go, man, he was a genius. That's what I need is I need your loyal. Cause as a leader, you're making decisions all the time. And, um, it's funny when when I get out of the office every night, it's like decision fatigue where it's mm. like, if, you know, if I'm dating somebody and they're like, where do you want to go to eat? I'm like, I don't care. You mm-hmm. pick. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I made a thousand decisions today. You pick uh, you pick where. Um, but 
as a leader, you have to make decisions and they're not always right. It's, you, you make decisions and you have to make a lot of them really quick with the information that's in front of you. But I say that because that always stuck with me. And then when I became a head coach, I go, man, Paul Maneri was exactly right. Man, I need your loyalty. And he was 100 percent right. Mm. So you've always seemed to kind of give on that side of like definitely. I mean, like I said, you you are starting to ingrain this culture, too. So it seemed like that you need to check that box, you know, and that's what you're kind of doing with. You know, you said you're hiring young, you're really hiring guys that you've had, so they kind of know the culture, know what you're going to do, and and then you'll if you can teach it to 18 year olds, I'm sure you can teach it to your to your adults. Well, <clears throat> you know? yeah, I've got two guys on my staff that I actually recruited and coached. I mean, Austin Knight, I was able to coach for three years, and then Colby Bortles, I recruited to Ole Miss and was able to coach him his freshman year when we went to Omaha in 2014. So, guys that I trusted back then. And I still trust today. I mean, that that's pretty special. And um, Blake Hardigree, our director of operations, is my right-hand man. And he's been with me since 2019. And I was scared to death when I hired him because Pete Biscano was my director of baseball operations from day one in 2014 when I got hired in the summer to after the 2019 season when he moved to Wisconsin with his wife, cause she got a great job and I, I was scared to death because I knew how awesome he was, but now Blake has done a great job. So uh, our, our staff is tremendous. And I don't say that just cause I'm on a podcast. It's, it's really, they're great people. They're hardworking. They care about the program. And um, when people take it personal, when we don't, uh, succeed at whatever level, whether you're the pitching coach and one of your pitchers, pitch is bad or I'm the hitting coach and we don't hit good. When you take it personal, those people figure it out because they take it personal that we're not succeeding at the level that we need to succeed. Yeah. I mean, and I could, I, it's like, even from the outside looking in, like you just tell like, it's much more intimate at ECO. Those guys do, and you guys do take it. It's just a different, it is a different loyalty, a different commitment. Um, and it's so good to see, you know, like, especially like, you know, Palumbo's got Maryland roots and, and, and I know his brother and, and, you know, he's got a tremendous reputation and like, like, yeah, I mean, I couldn't, I couldn't agree more. I mean, even just, like I said, from an outside, you know, like not knowing the inside and what you, and just what, how you guys do and how you do business. It's, it's really awesome. Um, you know, and I'm sure it's, it's, it, it's great that it keeps popping up for you because yeah, you put these guys in great positions and like you said, you can't be mad at them and, you know, you just have to keep finding the next guy, <laughs> right? you know, but it's like you said at the beginning, like. You know, you, you're never given a handbook on these like tough situations, you know, and you seem like, you know, you, you seem to really, well, he, he left, he left here in the winter and he, le- and then you're just like, and you just, you keep moving on, you know, and it's just, it's just great. I think when you were doing it, players is like, you're this guy too. And I, I'm hoping that your players see, like, I'm not just telling you these things. Like we're also doing all the, like, this is how we are. Like, this is how I am. You know, like you're the, you lead by example. Well, I, I, I feel like I do, you know, um, you know, I always tell them like, you look, the coaches are here before you get here and they're here after you get done. So, you know, we're invested in this and we're invested in you and we try to give them, you know, as much as we can. I mean, look, we're, we're supported at a level that, um, as high as any ACC or SEC program. And I just use those for an example, because we've been able to win we've been able to do it the right way. We've been able to do good in school and still do it. So our administration has graced us with, and our really donors have helped us, you know, create a restricted fund. And if we need something from it being an eye pitch machine or track Mm -hmm. van or, you know, charter a flight, we're able to do those things because of, you know, what the kids have done. So I try to reward those guys as much as possible. And then, remind the new guys that come in every year hey when we're chartering this flight this didn't happen back in 2015 like this (laughs) so you need to thank all the older guys that were here way before and they're not even here anymore because they laid the foundation for what you have today and you know this nice hitting indoor and the pitching indoor that you have like this wasn't here when we got here so you need to understand that and we just always talk about leaving the place better than how you found it and you know one of the coolest moments for me in the super regional, we had an alumni area down the first baseline and, you know, all the generations that are, that are, you know, merged together from guys that I played with to guys that I actually had coached. Now they're, they're getting together and, you know, having a beer and, and having a good time and just telling stories. And, 
you know, you can't put a monetary value on that stuff and, and look, like I said, nobody wants to go to Omaha more than, than me, but those guys just being there and a guy like Seth Manus, who's pitched in the world series, texts me and goes, man, Friday of the super regional is the best sporting event I've ever been to. And you're like, <laughs> you pitched in the world series, man, what are you talking about? Like, that, right. that, that was really awesome. And, you know, even in a, tough situation for for guys that careers were over on them that monday when i met with them like i read them that message and i said hey man like this doesn't happen everywhere this is like awesome so it, it sucks and it hurts and you guys are best a lot and we're so close but at the end of the day like this is a special place oh yeah i'm just thinking about like you um you know each coach has like maybe unique things that maybe they do like again coming back to the attention award of like Cause it comes down to like what I feel is like gr- it's grateful gratitude, you know, be thankful. This wasn't here in 2015, you know, um, are, do you guys, are you intentional about like uh, certain things that they do? Maybe certain things your players do to, to show that gratitude. Like, are they uh, di- giving back to cer- certain places? Like do you do much? I would say like either community service work, like, are you going out or like, do they, do they write thank you notes? Some people write thank you notes. They do like a leg uh, letters to alumni, like, I'm just wondering if you do anything like that to kind of, like you said, to show, hey, this this hasn't always been like this. Well, we do as much as we can with community. Look, the, the Little League program here in Greenville is as good as any place in the country. They've got like a $2 million Little League stadium about a mile away from our stadium, which is, is unbelievable. And they were in the Little League World Series a couple of years ago, and I was able to actually – use one of my best friends planes and, and fly the staff up there, uh, Garrett Blackwater, who played basketball at East Carolina and was one of my roommates. And we went up there. It was awesome. But to give back to the community and going to the children's hospital or helping out with the food bank or, you know, back in the, I think it was the fall of 2018, there was a hurricane that came through the North Carolina East coast and New Bern got flooded, which is about 45 minutes away. And, we took the guys and helped them gut out a few houses that had been flooded. And um, so just giving back to people that are way less fortunate, that's a huge thing. And we write gratitude letters right before Thanksgiving and they get to choose who they want to, to write them to. And um, yeah, I think it's important, man. Look, you, you would none of us would be where we are today without some help. I mean, it takes a village to help somebody be successful and everybody comes from a different background whether it be a great family or a divorced family like me, or um, you didn't have as much as you wanted to growing up. So it's important to always give back. Hold on. Yes. Yes, sir. Um, oh, gosh. Great coach. Um, just thinking about, um, you know, what was – I don't, I don't, you've been, like, you've talked about like the great players that you've been around, um, you know, and, and really talking because there's there's a lot of players that that listen in as well. Like just thinking about like what do those great players like you said the guy that pitched in the World Series right like you, Old Miss like you've got tremendous players that you've played uh, that you've already coached in all your different stops and at ECU. What do they have in common? Like what would you say? You know, in your in your eyes and in, in your language, like what do they have in common? I think their number one thing is they're comfortable in their own skin. And mm. for young players that don't understand that is um, be who you are, you know, and whether you uh, are nerdy off the field, but you're comfortable doing that. We had a player that actually was a walk on out of Pennsylvania, Brady Lloyd, and he wore like the throwback Reebok pumps or whatever. I mean, those were like back when I was in elementary school and had a mullet and he wasn't the best, but he was comfortable. And I always use my example, like this dude walks around campus looking like this and he thinks it's cool and nobody else does, but he's comfortable (laughs) in his own skin. Um, I I think that's a big part. Um, I think also the, the competitive nature you know, and I'm just talking about two players specifically um, in our program recently, Alec Burleson, who's leading pretty much every category in AAA right now um, with the Cardinals. He hated losing. Like he, he's as much like me as any player that I've ever coached when it came to, you know, you win and you're like, it's almost like an exhale of, oh, we won, you lose. And 
you're ready to go rip somebody's head off. Now I've grown up, but I was like, <laughs> like Burley was as a player when I played at East Carolina, but Jacob Jenkins coward, I call him JC, uh, a guy that if he'd have told me he was going to hit in a three or four hole for us as a freshman last fall, I'd have lost everything I had, but he just showed up and competed at whatever we're doing every day, whether it be in the weight room, whether it be uh, at baseball practice. And he just got so much better over a six month time period and of course, yeah, he had naturally gifted ability and talent, but just showed up and competed. And I think that's a lost art in our youth because with um, the situations they're put in by society, sometimes they're, hey, if you just show up, you get a participation trophy. And um, they have a scoreboard for a reason. I, I mean, that's why they put the score up there. You either win or you lose. And, and not that you can't lose and still learn a valuable lesson out of it, but I was brought up to compete, man. That's what you, you you put in all this hard work. I mean, you want to win. And when you see kids crying after we lose a game in a, you know, to end the season, whether it be in a super regional setting or a regional setting, whatever it may be, it's because they've invested so much. And I think that's good life learning experience of, man, I, I gave everything I had and we didn't win, but, you're upset because of the amount of time, energy, and effort you put in. And, and then the relationship piece of, you know, I tell our teams that the reason that I get emotional and I, I cry, which most people would think, hey, you're not a cry, but I'm emotional when it comes to stuff like that. It's because I'll never coach those guys that are seniors or are going to get drafted. Um, you know, I can remember being in Vanderbilt's out, outfield and being as emotional as I've, I've ever been and knowing that you're never going to coach Gavin Williams again. You're never going to coach – uh, Connor Norby again. You're never going to coach Thomas Francisco. And then we had two six year seniors on our team, Matt Bridges and Cam Colmore. I mean, I've been with those guys for six years, you know, and those guys will never throw a pitch for us again. Or Tyler Smith, who was a fifth year senior on that team. So it, it's emotional because the amount of time, energy, and effort that we've all put into it. And there's some guys that, you know, will never put that uni on again. Mm. Mm. Ultra competitive. Comfortable in your own skin. Phenomenal. Phenomenal. Um, just wrapping things up here because I know you got to go on. And um, just looking at last because it just brought to mind because this, this is kind of like advice too, you know, like you you mentioned prior to this was the advice to uh, the advice to coaches. And you talked about, you know, hiring um, young and the loyalty and then it'd work out. Um, for one, is there any other advice that you would give to coaches? And then two, any advice to players? Because I guess you, you were you were, t- we were talking about players, so I was thinking about that. Any other advice beyond like those are two very very good traits? Um, be who you are. Be competitive. Hate losing. Um, and then is there anything else, other anything other kind of advice? With players, I, I'd give a couple. And these are coming off the top of my head since you you kind of pulled that one out of left field, which <laughs> I'm fine with. But. Um, Wherever you invest your time, that's where you're going to see the, the the best results. So if you invest all your time on social media or playing Fortnite, you're going to see your best results there. So don't tell me that you want to play in the big leagues when you spend four hours on show, social media a day and two hours playing Fortnite because that's not what it's going to take to get to the big leagues. Um, the five you become the average of the five people you hang around the most. So who who are your friends? What are they doing? Are they pushing you to be better at just being a better person, a better student, a better uh, lifter, a better baseball player? Um, But it's all about who you surround yourself with. I mean, I'm a firm believer in that. But wherever you invest your time, that's where you're going to see the biggest growth. Now, everybody has different strengths. God's blessed us with all different talent levels. I tell our team this every year because there's some guys that, can study a little bit, still get a 4-0. There's some guys that can study their tail off and only get a 3-0. That's okay. But probably the guy that's a 3-0 might throw 95. Who knows? But the guy that gets a 4-0, he can work his tail off and maybe not ever throw 95, but can still be a very good pitcher because he has really good command and he has three solid pitches. And don't play the comparison game. And it's very easy if you stay on social media. Even myself, who is a 44-year-old, you can look and go, Oh my God, my friends are like on vacation. I'm grinding here in the office. They're on vacation, sipping on my ties down in, you know, Atlantis down in the Bahamas. You've got to be the best version of yourself. But going back to it, 
being comfortable in your own skin, being competitive at what, if you're going to do it, give it everything you got, because that's going to translate into everything that you do. If you're slacking in school, and I'm a big believer in this, because you don't like doing it, we're going to give you something in our program that's going to really help you in baseball, but because you don't like it and it makes you uncomfortable, you're not going to give 100% effort. Well, that's not going to allow you to be the best baseball player that you can be. So you got to learn how to do things that you don't necessarily love to. Nobody loves school. I was a two-time academic All-American at East Carolina, and I didn't like school. Nobody likes accounting. Nobody likes, you know, MIS major, which I majored in. I mean, I didn't like computer coding, but you just had to do it to get the degree. So you had to do it at a high level. As a coach, and coaching is more competitive than it was when I first got started. You know, everybody will get paid more. It's super competitive. but one thing, and it was a blessing to me. I didn't have the social media when I first started coaching, but it was like I had blinders on. I made $8,000 at UNCW for an entire year being the volunteer, and I loved it. I love mowing the grass, and I love working with the catchers, and Randy Hood would let me help with the hitters. And, like, life was pretty easy back then, even though I was running up my credit card. But you didn't have to worry about all the stuff I have to worry about now as a head coach. And, you know, I, I was responsible for my little area and I didn't have to worry about the pitchers or I didn't have to worry about managing a program and managing 70 people, including all your staff, whatever it may be. Um, and then my next job, I made 12, five, I, I got the job at Vanderbilt as director of baseball operations because the East coast professional showcase was at UNCW, which is the top 150 players. And every college coach was there recruiting. And Eric Backage, who's now the head coach at Clemson, we played together here at East Carolina. And so I was like working on the field. And, you know, I looked like, a, you know, an immigrant worker on the field because <laughs> I, I tan easy, as you can see. And <laughs> I got mud and stuff all over me. And um, I hope that doesn't offend anybody because it's not, I'm, I'm just trying to make a good picture for everybody. But I just had been working my tail off, sweating all over. And then I'd open up a book and, I like I knew what I was doing, taking notes. And Tim Corbin asked Eric Backage, hey, who's that guy that you're hanging around with? And he said, oh, that's Cliff. You know, we played in college. And he said, do you think he'd be interested in our director of baseball operations job? And back then, I didn't know what that was. I didn't know what it meant. Nobody had him. And, um, you know, Eric's like, hey, man, he's unbelievable. And at the time, Corbs wasn't who he is today. He was a great coach, but nobody knew it. And I, I was like his right hand man for a year. And I tell people all the time for one year, that's the biggest learning curve for my coaching career, because I literally was in Tim Corbin's office every day. And I was learning about every aspect about running a program from, you know, raising money to compliance, to practice uh, organization, to the bullpen club, um, which was a fundraising thing to recruiting and, Man, I was drinking out of a fire hose and had no idea. But, man, I was like super jacked to just be next to that guy and just soaking it all in. And But really to keep blinders on and not worry about what somebody else is doing. And, and to be educated on a lot of different things, but understanding, hey, this is what I want to be good at. Because when people spread themselves too thin, then you're not very good at anything. And sometimes when you go to coaches convention, you get all these ideas and you want to put them. But Coach Bianco says it best. You can get the players to do anything, but you can't get them to do everything. You have to stay true to what you're good at. And, yeah, you can take a piece here and there. But, man, if you start trying to bring in eight new pieces every year, then you're going to look up and, man, you're just very average at a lot of different stuff instead of being really good at, at what you do as a coach and what your program does, if that makes sense. But – for coaches, I would just say work hard, work your tail off, be loyal to the people that you work for, even if you um, don't necessarily agree with every decision, because that's going to help you move up in the profession. Wow, fantastic! I know that uh, we got to go on, and I just, I, I just, I feel like, and the reason I, I kind of asked went there, went there, coach, is just I feel like uh, you have a great way of just inspiring people and a great way of just giving great advice and. And like I said, you've just through the conversation, people know like you've been through the tough situation, the tough, tough moment. And also you've been at the highest level to to be able to where people can believe to learn from what you've what you've done. Well, so I just want to I want to thank you. I really want to thank you for taking some time with us. 
Well, and I appreciate it. And I just would leave everybody with this is look, I'm a small town boy that grew up in Snow Hill, North Carolina and um, middle-class family worked on the farm and never even probably dreamed of being at the position that I'm, I'm in. You know, I wanted to be a professional athlete like everybody else probably did at a young age. And, um, but my parents instilled a tremendous amount of work ethic and not making excuses and just keep going and keep grinding. And it's really by showing up, just keep showing up. I mean, look, man, you have bad days. I mean, everybody, Hey, whatever profession you go into, you have bad days, but the ones that just keep showing up and have that consistent work ethic, they're going to have success in whatever profession that they choose to. It just ain't going to happen tomorrow. Like, Hey, you ain't going to win the lottery tomorrow. Like that doesn't happen in any profession that you're, work for you just got to keep showing up and treating people like you want to be treated and um it's not always going to work out you're going to fail and you're going to get bloodied and you're going to stumble but at the end of the day it will work out in the long run if you keep showing up every day coach Guth godwin from east carolina university just giving us some great information uh really just loved a couple things uh, right from the bat just talk about how his rings represent relationships i think it spoke a lot about who he is uh, he talked about he believes he has ecus for the moments not necessarily not the championships he's there for the moments uh throughout the conversation talk about the tough times guys dealing with tragic incidents dealing with things that you're not really told how to deal with for the most part when you're getting into coaching uh, a lot of times when you're getting into teaching you're dealing with people, you have to be the model, which Coach Godwin is, and continue to be as strong as you can for those people that you're involved with. How he felt like culture is more important than any mechanic. How he makes each person stand up in front of the team to recite their mission, their vision, their code, their motto, the Pirates paragraph. And just love how you talk about those loyalty, the loyalty within having a staff. I think we've heard that multiple times. It's been a pretty consistent message about assistant coaches and your staff, having people, having the right people. You know, and again, he was talking about having the loyalty in front of the skill. If you hire the loyal, hardworking, things will work out. You can teach the skill. Just continue great advice from a player, some of the biggest ones. I think it was with all of us, is don't play the comparison game. Be the best version of yourself. I think in coaching, we hear that again. That's been a pretty consistent uh, coaching message as well. Is be the best version of us. Make sure we're the best version of ourselves. Some really great things by Coach Godwin. I just can't thank him enough for taking some time out of his day to talk for us here in the podcast and help us get better. I know I was able to learn a lot. And again, just love his message. Always love his message and how he approaches the game and how they continue to do great things at ECU. So thank you guys for listening. Thank you guys. Thank the guys at Netting Pros. And, of course, thank you, Coach Godwin, for helping us get better. So until next week, keep getting better.